by a lake in Las Vegas. We set up camp at Story Lake State Park, two miles north of Las Vegas. Ernie and I fell asleep upon arrival, and I fell into a dream. The two of us were in someone's front yard, out near the street in some unfamiliar neighborhood, landscaping, edging, and pulling weeds. And then there was an explosion in the middle distance, and smoke all above the rooftops and chimneys. I moved past a fence with a tennis court windscreen, and then I saw it more clearly. A plane had crashed, but a large section of the plane was still intact. There was also a crane and a station wagon being lifted by the crane, up and out of the middle of the fuselage. The station wagon was loaded for a family vacation. Bicycles, inner tubes, kids, and a dog. It was quickly clear what the family had done what we all do on some of the rougher ferry rides. They had chosen to stay downstairs with the vehicles instead of venturing up on deck in questionable or inclement weather. The wagon was completely charbroiled, charbroiled, but the family was unharmed. The sky was clear and, and the sun was shining brightly, reflecting hard off the wagon's windshield. Hey, Bozo, get up, Ernie shouted in my ear. We're going for a drive. It was mid-afternoon. Ernie and Abe were both hungry. We spent the rest of the day in town, first at a Mexican restaurant by the town green, and then at the little Las Vegas movie house, where we saw a special Wednesday sneak preview screening of Jurassic Park, opening night. The theater was a frontier affair, rustic timber posts and natural wood paneling and it seemed like a whole town and it seemed like the whole town was there when we arrived single seats were the only ones available so we were forced to split up all three of us ended up in the front three rows of the theater seated with all the town's under 10 year olds there were many screams throughout the film and even some sobbing among the littler ones there were many screams there were many screams throughout the film, and even some sobbing among the littler ones. Ernie and Abe were in the front two rows. At one point, I witnessed Ernest bop a young movie fan on the head with a heavy hand. Thursday morning, Ernie woke up early, left the tent, looked around a bit, and then fell asleep again on clumps of stiff grass and pebbles near the truck. It didn't look comfortable, but he was already asleep. Too heavy to notice like Godzilla crushing a few cars with his feet, with his feet. He spoke up with, excuse me, he woke up with weed clump and pebble prints all over this whole side of his face. Try it again. He woke up with weed clump and pebble prints over the whole left side of his face. Later in the morning, storm clouds rolled over the hills on the far western side of Story Lake. For an hour, we sat inside the truck listening to Abe's Mozart mix and the thunder, while the dark electric sky moved over and by. A violent parade of multi-branched bolts of lightning and... A violent parade of multi-branched bolts of yellow and blue lightning reaching into the hills from deep in the smoky... from deep in the smoky clouds and columns of silver rain all around us. And there was a man out there windsurfing. He crossed in the dark side, he crossed to the dark side on a final pass, and then brought the board back and beached it down in front of us. He walked out on the lake, he walked out of the lake and right up to our vehicle like a neoprene nightmare. We waited for him to speak. You fellas are cold. You look like you could use a hot meal. You should see what you look like, mister. Abe smiled and told the guy. The guy seemed charmed. The black clouds passed and, and the warm southwest sun came blazing. The three of us stepped out into the mud and, stared, and started down toward his VW van again. He told us he was chasing down a low pressure system and that he'd be leaving for another lake at the end of the day. Another system came through just south of here, he told us confidently. That one was just a freak squall. I was looking down at the slick ground in front of me, but turned up and around to get a good look at the parting clouds. 
Hear that, Abraham? Began Ernie. They named a storm after you. Then Ernie slipped suddenly and slid for several feet before regaining his balance. Arms to the sides, like he was trying to keep the lids on a couple of exploding garbage cans. The guy served rice and beans in his VW kitchen, in his VW kitchen, and gave us gave us names of good places to visit in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. Abe talked to him about directions while Ernie looked around. Yours truly, overwhelmed with the utilitarian coziness of the VW's living room, started to think about Jennifer again, and then about Ernest, how different the two of us are. He's immature and, and really well built, and I'm only and I'm only one of those. But she had grown tired of the Ernie type, that I was sure of. In the late afternoon, Ernie and I watched the big birds, turkey vultures, hopping up and down at the edge of the lake, stretching their wings. The name was a gift from the windsurfing guy, now more than just strange birds of prey. Turkey vultures, indigenous to, north, to northeastern New Mexico. The three of us then met around the hood of the truck to plan the next three days. The next three days. Santa Fe, maybe Albuquerque, maybe Albuquerque, maybe Taos. And discovered quickly we couldn't plan anything after that, let alone that. Abe disappeared for a while and Ernie wrestled with a muddy tent under a spigot by the ranger's hut. I sat on the tailgate and pondered my extended adolescence. At the beginning of college, I bought a few things. I bought, listen to me. At the beginning of college, I thought I knew some things. Then for four years, I tried to figure out whether any of that stuff was true. Second semester of, of, second semester of senior year, I tried not to worry about it so much and just hung around on the grass a lot. I was trying to fill the void. Uncertainty, loneliness, what have you. I was a guy who always assumed that the people I knew I would always know, and that my future soulmate would, by necessity, turn out to be a girl I already knew, like Jennifer. The sand and water of our relationship will no doubt harden into something more concrete. She skidded up to me on her bike. I didn't see her coming. She laughed when she saw the fear on my face. She stepped off and we walked the three or so blocks to the tea stop together, the Boston subway. She looked all business, the business of the, biz, of the, business of the busy college student. She had on a typical outfit of her, of her white cotton yoga pants and her vintage Kansas City Chiefs three quarter sleeve t-shirt and a dark blue cotton sweater lightly tied lightly around her waist. The outfit was plain but revealing. I knew her body well. I had memorized the whole light olive map of her right up to where right up to where not being her boyfriend restricted the access. Near and around the revealing edges of sporty running shorts and t shirts. And she knew what I knew. I made no secret of my looking. It was just a natural and unfortunate aspect of our intimacy as friends. We were talking as we walked, Jenny breathing heavily for a minute after her dismount from the bike. Have you ever been to Sedona? She asked me. Sedona? I'd never heard of it. It's this place in Arizona. I was, I was reading about it from one of my classes. Yeah? It's out in the middle of the desert. There are these huge red rocks there, and these vortexes. People go from all over to meditate there. Why there? What is it, one of those desert health spas? One of those desert health spas? It was important that I followed these Jenny conversations to their logical conclusions. Probably, but the vortexes sound pretty interesting. They, they supposedly have these energy currents that go straight to the center of the earth. The Indians built up a bunch of rocks around them. She was quiet for a second or two. That's where the people go to meditate. Sounds pretty neat, I said. But do you really believe in all that? All that new age nonsense? I asked Jennifer boldly. 
course I do. What's not to believe? She looked at me. The stuff is there. We arrived at our split. Jenny hitting outbound on the red line and me hitting inbound. I stood there while she, while she locked her bike to a parking meter. I was about to change the subject to see what her night looked like, but it didn't work. There's nothing new age about it, she said with a frown, quite clearly disappointed with me. She opened the door to the outbound tea station and was gone. See you later, I shouted to her through the heavy closing door. She was forever leaving me standing. When the guys got back to the truck, we drove on, and I stared out my windows, leaving behind the small Las Vegas with its night lights only at the gas station and the a and moving, moving quickly again with a half eye open for the filming of some brave new cigarette commercial. It was a good time to have one. It had been a long time. Ern, pass me a cigarette. What? You heard me a cigarette. Pass me one. Ernie turned and looked at me, with a quizzical look at first, but then it was gone and he turned back around. Not a chance, psycho. Just give me one, I need it. I declared, noticing adobe buildings running by in quickening succession, heading southwest towards the outskirts of Santa Fe. But he didn't answer. He chuckled to himself for a second, just as amused as he needed to be. And I saw Abe shake his head. Then he leaned in to change the tape. Just forget it, I said. Then I turned and started sand sharking my hand in the wind out the window, sporadically, back and forth, side to side. 